Okay, so uh, Mark chapter 9, we're going to carry on with that. So if you could t uh, turn your phones down, get your ringtones off, and um, we'll pray and we'll make a start. So let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we, Father, are going to read about your Son here in your word. And we pray that he might become real for us today and that truly we will know him and the power of his spirit and his way and that we might have him as our lord our master and our precious savior and that we might grow to love him and to see what he is really about and to absolutely surrender all for him and for all that he stands for and all that we see and know in him for his sake amen <laughs> right so um can you ask peter to take the urn away Right, so they went from there and passed through Galilee, and Jesus didn't want anyone to know it, for he taught his disciples. So this is a theme that you see all through, that Jesus is focused very much on just teaching the disciples. You might think, well, he had the power to do all kinds of miracles. Why didn't he just go around healing people, feeding people, etc.? And although there are a few cases where he does that, you'll find that his main focus is upon teaching. And you know, you wonder why that is. And it is because above all, he wanted to save people. He wanted to bring people to know God and to live forever and to have their sins forgiven. That in the end is way more significant than getting healing, than getting miracles, than getting food, etc. And so he's in Galilee and he teaches the disciples and he said to them, the Son of Man, that's the Lord Jesus, that's him. And you know, the Son of Man was his favorite title for himself. He was Son of God as well, but he was Son of Man in that his mother Mary was an ordinary human being. And that was his preferred favorite title of himself. And you can understand why that is. It's because he had our nature that he completely knows all our human experience. So he says, the Son of Man is delivered up into the hands of men. They shall kill him. And when he's killed, after three days, he shall rise again. It's absolutely clear. He clearly knew what was going to happen. He knew all about the crucifixion, his death, that he'd be dead for three days and resurrect. Absolutely clear. But when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, this is just before he actually dies, he basically says to God, take this cup away from me. I don't want to do this. He's frightened. He's scared. And we are told, in fact, in Hebrews that he was saved from his fear of death. So he had the fear of death that any man has facing the end. So he was not a puppet. He was not just sort of a cardboard person. He was actually really having our nature and absolutely understanding how we feel. And this, it's in this sense that man is not alone, that we know that we can be sure that all our experiences are understood by him. And if you wonder why he suffered so much, not just in the, in the nature of his death by, by torture, you know, crucifixion was torture, torturing every bone in his body, but why did he have such a wide experience of betrayal by Judas, rejection by his own people, etc.? Well, it was so that, I think, he could come to actually understand every single human feeling, so that none of us can say, nobody knows how I feel. Maybe on earth there is nobody who knows how you feel, but there is Jesus in heaven who does know exactly how you feel. But, verse 32, they didn't understand and they were frightened to ask him. And you think, why did they not understand this? This is very simple language. This is not rocket science to understand. And I suggest that when we don't understand something, it isn't because of, if you like, intellectual failure. It's because we don't want to accept the implications. 
You think in the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel, he was hoping and hoping that Judah would be, would be restored from Babylon, would go back to Jerusalem and all that. And he's given a vision where he sees that this is not going to happen for very many years. And he says, and I didn't understand it. Yes, because we don't understand when we don't want to understand. And particularly there was this refusal to understand about the crucifixion. That Jesus would die by crucifixion. And why didn't people understand it? And I think it's largely because people, we all, realise that because he died for me, I cannot be indifferent anymore. I have got someone who actually died for me. He died for me. And that means that I am eternally under that deep impression. He died for me. And he died in order to get my sins forgiven. Well, why would we not want to understand that? Well, because if that is so, and it is so, that takes a grip on your entire life on your entire thinking that someone died for me someone rose again for me all my sins are forgiven I'm going to live forever because of what he did and because of his resurrection and you may think well who would say no to that well actually we would say no to that because it, it comes a bit to sort of interfering with our little life and our bad habits and our sinful way of going on the fact that wow it's all forgiven and you can live forever well yeah it sounds a nice idea but people shy away from it and i say to people why don't you get baptized into jesus you share in his death and resurrection and you can live forever and have your sins forgiven or oh, no yeah nice idea but something stops them well i don't understand well, what is there not to understand so, verse 33, they went to Capernaum, which is just a little fishing village on the Sea of Galilee. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you reasoning about on the way here? And again, you see how he's always trying to, he's always trying to get them on their own and talk directly, privately to people. We saw how when he cured the blind man, he took him by the hand and gently led him out of the village so that he could talk to him one on one and this is his style you see him very often in the gospels in people's houses he wasn't like some big evangelist yes he did do some very big preaching uh, in jerusalem and uh, when he fed the four thousand the five thousand and all that but i don't think that was his typical style his style was one on one or small groups so he said to them uh, what were you arguing about on the way? And they kept quiet, for they had disputed one with another on the way <clears throat> about who was the greatest. So there's Jesus saying, I am going to die for you, I'm going to resurrect. You know, death is going to be destroyed. No more death, you're going to be able to live forever because of what I'm going to do. But they didn't understand because actually they were in the middle of an argument with each other about who's the best. I'm better than you. No, Peter, I'm better than you. No, you're worse than me. You're less than me. You think, how could it be that there's the Son of God talking about his death and resurrection and these people are having some petty, silly argument about I'm cooler than you? How can it be? But you actually see it when the Lord Jesus dies on the cross. Because there is the Son of God nailed to a tree, to the cross. And at the bottom of the cross, there were the Roman soldiers who were uh, guarding the body. And they were gambling with dice over who should actually have his, um, his clothes. Oh, I want to have the sandals. Oh, no, no, I, I want to have this, I, I want to have that. Um, you know, absolutely incredible. That just metres away, or not even, you know, one and a half metres away from the suffering Son of God, men are arguing about who's going to get his sandals. Oh, I want to get his jacket. 
and throwing dice. And I'm just totally distracted. And unfortunately, we can all be the same, that we can consider that, yeah, okay, these great things about, yeah, Jesus died for me and I'm going to live forever. All my sins are forgiven and I'm going to live forever. Uh, but the here and now, whatever petty little things are going on in our lives right now, dominate and get in the way. And it's a classic case. He's told them he's going to die and rise again, but they don't understand because they're, they're sidetracked with some stupid argument about who is going to be the greatest. It's bizarre. So he sat down, verse 35, and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he shall be last of all, and servant of all. And there you have it. Yeah, and you, you, you notice his um, psychology. They're in the house, and he says to them, he sits them down, he says, Now, what were you talking about on the way? And there was silence. And he, he knew, of course, because he was, if you like, the psychologist extraordinaire, that he, um, he knew and knows the hearts of, of men. And it seems he said nothing. And that silence <laughs> was absolutely deafening. They knew that he knew. And then it seems they all slunk off. And then again, verse 35, he calls the twelve. And he raises it up again, this subject. He says to them, if anyone would be first, he should be last of all and servant of all. And if you ask yourself, well, who was the servant of all? Well, it was the Lord Jesus. You'd remember him washing the disciples' feet in the, in the last supper, the evening before he, he died. And he says that this is the work of the servant, to wash the feet of the visitors. And he says, and I have done this for you and of course who's going to be the first in God's kingdom of course it is the Lord Jesus why because he was last of all and servant of all and so this is what it is to be a Christian is to be a servant and that is not what people want to be I want to be the big guy I, I want to you know, have money and power and everything and relationships and be seen well of men but we are following Jesus. And this is where religion per se, what I call churchianity, has so misled people. That you think that the greatest guy in the church is the fellow with the expensive clothes and the big gold cross around his neck and the big hat on his head and all that. No. The Lord Jesus is first, will be first and is first because he was servant of all. So he washed the disciples' feet. And so, for example, who's going to clean the toilets? <laughs> Here, you know, this is what it is to be a servant of all. So he took a little child and set him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, like cuddling him, he said to them, Whoever shall receive one of such little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him that sent me. So there they were in a circle around him and he sort of breaks the circle. He makes them open the circle and he brings this little child in, in the midst of them. And of course the child surrounded by 12 grown men, the child would have been awkward and shy and uh, just looking at the ground and I guess they weren't too happy to see the child. And then Jesus cuddles him and says, whoever will receive one of such little children receives me. He's saying, that child is me. And actually that child represents not only me, but also God. Whoever receives the child receives not only me, but him that sent me. So that the child represented Jesus, he represented God. So then, Jesus received him. Whoever shall receive a little child receives me. And when you read the Gospel records, he says, or, or the, the Gospel records say, that there's a big crowd of people and Jesus received them. He received them. And what does that mean? He received them and he spoke to them. I think he received them in the sense that 
somehow his body language was such that he was saying, look, I accept you. And as I keep saying, Jesus Christ, Paul says, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But Jesus, who received people, there was something about him that, that somehow said, I'm open to you. I accept you as you are. That is how he was and how he presents here in the Gospels. That is how he is today. And that is how he always will be, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, of course, the, this, the disciples didn't want to receive this little child. Like, clear off, you're irrelevant. And children had really no status, of course, in, um, in their society. But, again, this is the point, that the person with no status, the person who is just dumb and shy and awkward, is the one who represents Jesus, who then in turn represents God. And in this context of receiving the little child, John said to him, verse 38, Teacher, we saw one casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him, because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him. For there is no one who shall do a mighty work that's a miracle in my name, and then be able straight afterwards to immediately speak evil of me. So, I think that this guy who they'd seen uh, trying to do a miracle was probably a follower of John the Baptist. And then he says, verse 40, he that is not against us is for us. So he's saying, yeah, I know John sees me a bit differently and his followers see me and, and my followers a bit differently, but accept him. It's in the same spirit as the little child being welcomed into the midst Jesus saying, open your circle, let the, let the boy in. 4.41, for whoever will give you a cup of water to drink because you are Christ's, truly I say to you, he shall in no way lose his reward. Now, you see there how Jesus is so sensitive to whatever you do. So sensitive. Even just giving a cup of water to somebody. He is so sensitive, and there will be a reward for that. When will that reward be? You don't get any reward in this life. The reward will be when Jesus comes back, and there is the resurrection, and there is the day of judgment. And when we read in the other teaching of Jesus, he will say, When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. So actually every little thing that goes on in our lives now, every little thing you do, actually will have its reward, will have its eternal consequence, its eternal moment. And so what you, what you see from that then is that life then becomes very, very significant. It actually matters how we live. It matters how we live. Because every little thing is going to actually have some eternal consequence. So in that sense, now in this life, you are shaping the kind of person, the kind of eternal experience that you're going to have. If you see someone first and you can't even be bothered to give them a cup of, of water, well, okay, so that will have its consequence. Whereas Jesus says here, if you give a cup of water, water to drink to someone who is Christ's, you will in no way lose your reward for that. Now in this life there is no real gratitude. It is something that everybody laments, that you know, parents lament it, don't they? Oh, I do everything for my kid but not appreciated. Do everything, oh, wash clothes, not appreciated. Cook food, not appreciated. Um, sense of entitlement these days with people. And whatever you do, Run a soup kitchen, do this, do that. You don't get any appreci appreciation. No, absolutely not. And yet there is, he says here, a reward for simply giving a cup of water to one of Christ's people to drink. But that reward is not now. You don't get any thanks in this life. In fact, every good deed uh, seems to not go unpunished. In other words, you, you suffer for doing good to someone. But... 
the day will come when the Lord Jesus comes back and there will be the day of judgment when although we are not saved by our works because we're saved by grace in another sense all that we have done will have its eternal consequence Jesus told a parable where different workers in the vineyard work different amounts of hours and yet they all got the same reward a penny a day and in that parable he was trying to show that no matter how hard you work salvation is by grace and it's like the penny a day that all the workers get the lazy ones the strong ones the hard workers the lazy ones all get the same but in another sense Jesus is coming and at the day of judgment there will be as he says to give every man according as his work shall be so although salvation itself that is eternal life is a pure gift it is also true to say that everything that we do for the Lord now will also have its reward there will be in that sense a also a judgment of works the nature of how we will eternally be is determined right now today by how we live how we act how we think and that means that life is worth the living it means that life is significant it is not just a an existence it is significant it has meaning and that's what drives people to depression and addictions etc the sense that life is just not worth living that life is meaningless and yeah actually it is you're not wrong <coughs> apart from if we are in relationship with God and the Lord Jesus and actually you see that every every little thing is significant and has got eternal consequence and so he goes on whoever will cause one of these little ones that believe in me to stumble it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea well who are the little ones well he's talked about the child who came to him he's talked about the disciples of John the Baptist who had it slightly wrong but he says if you make a little one that believes in Jesus to stumble it would better that a millstone would put around your neck and you would thrown into the sea now that picture of a millstone around your neck being thrown into the sea that's what it says is going to happen to Babylon the great system that is anti-God and is evil, etc. The book of Revelation, it says that Babylon will be thrown into the sea like a great millstone. But here he says, if you make a little one stumble, this is what will happen to you. You will be thrown like a millstone, like a heavy stone, into the sea, never to come up again. So he's saying that you will share the judgment of Babylon at the last day. It means that you will be condemned along with the world. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, let a man examine himself, lest we be condemned with the world. So if we love this world and we, we make no separation in our heart between the way of the world and the way that I'm going, then we will share the judgment of this world when Jesus comes back. But if we are his people, we don't make others stumble, then, yeah, this will not happen to us. Then he says some very strange things. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's good for you to enter into life maimed, rather than having your two hands and to go into Gehenna, into the unquenched fire. Well, Gehenna was a rubbish dump outside Jerusalem, where all the rubbish was burnt, and because fresh rubbish kept being chucked onto the, onto the uh, fire, the fire was always burning. But the stuff that was put in the fire didn't keep burning. It just burnt back into dust. So he, he's, it's a figure, if you like, of complete destruction, of condemnation. And so Jesus says, if you do anything that might make a little one to stumble and not come to eternity, then pay whatever price it is so that you do not so that you do not do that because otherwise you are going to be condemned just burnt into into dust 
So, that's the thing. That the sensitivity of Jesus to the little one, you know, bringing the child into the midst of the disciples, making them open their circle, that is to be ours. And to actually see that we can have an effect upon people, that you can make someone stumble or you can save someone. Again, you see the meaning of life and the meaning of relationships and the significance of our attitude and actions towards other people. Forget about whether you're going to get in trouble with the, with the police or with the civil authorities. The main thing is that it's God who's looking. And again, looking at it positively, if you give just a cup of cold water to someone, you will in no way lose your reward. That's what he's saying. So, we'd like to pass the uh, bread and the juice out. <clears throat> so, we're going to take the bread and the wine, which represents the body and the blood of Jesus. And we do this to keep on bringing ourselves back to our focus on him. That he died for me. That I am not just a random person in this world. But that someone, Jesus, the Son of God, died for me and poured out his blood, gave his body for me so that I might live. Now, we saw at the start of this how Jesus told the disciples he was going to die and after three days rise again. But they were not focused on that and they didn't understand it because they were caught up with their little petty issues about who's the greatest. And... Let's not be like that. Let's see it. Let's get it for real. Get it for real. That he died for me. And he rose again for me. And this is all true for me. And that is the reality that can grip your life. And that is why we take the bread and the juice. That's why we, we make the effort to remember him. Because this is to be the continual reality that is before our eyes all the time. So let's just pray for the bread and pray for the wine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread and this wine that symbolize to us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. We pray that the wonder of the fact that he died for me and rose again for me may not be lost upon us. Please then go with us for his sake. Amen. <laughs>